Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, the Human Rights Foundation's conversation series where we expose dictators, debate pressing global human rights issues, and brainstorm how we can collectively put human rights at the top of the world agenda. My name is Alexander, and I'm a policy officer with HRF. HRF is an international nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting and protecting human rights globally with a focus on a countries under authoritarian rule. We unite people in the common cause of promoting liberal democracy. You can visit our website, hrf.org, to learn more about the work we do. Please also make sure to follow us on Twitter for more conversations like the one that we will be holding today. On February 24th, Russian forces launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Heavy artillery, missile strikes, and bombs have targeted civilian areas, destroying housing, hospitals, and orphanages. Many of these attacks are war crimes. There are already millions of refugees and many thousands of casualties. This war is Putin's war. His murderous, self-centered, and imperialistic behavior is responsible for a human rights catastrophe. Today is our first conversation in PutinCon, a new set of conversations here on Twitter, focusing on how to support human rights in Ukraine and Russia. This conversation will be recorded and released as a podcast. We have three guests this week. Yulia Marushevska is a Ukrainian civil activist, economic growth expert, and the former head of the Odessa Customs. She is currently in Western Ukraine, working to deliver humanitarian aid. Gary Kasparov is a Russian dissident and the chairman of the Human Rights Foundation. Moderating our, moderating our discussion will be Anne Applebaum, a staff writer for The Atlantic and a Pulitzer Prize winning historian of Eastern Europe. We will have some time at the end for questions. So if you have a question, please send me a DM on Twitter. Thank you everyone for joining us here today. I'm gonna to work on making sure that Yule can join this conversation. Um, and in the meantime, I'm gonna hand over the conversation to Anne. Um, it's great to be here with Gary. I hope that Yulia is going to join soon. Um, the conversation that I had wanted to have actually was one that Alexander hinted at in his introduction, um, which is one about the relationship between the nature of the Russian state and the kind of war that we're seeing unfold right now. Um, we have seen, we, you, know, we, I, you know, I'm going to ask Gary to talk about, first of all, what the Russian goals were in Ukraine, why the initial goals failed, and the nature of the war that we're seeing now. We, we are now seeing this morning there was an attack on a maternity hospital in Ukraine. There have been attacks on schools. There have been clear attacks on civilians. There have been targeting of civilians. Um, and what is this, you know, what, what is the goal of that and how does it reflect something about modern Russia? So, Gary, maybe we could start with, um, you know, the one of the most interesting questions, which is why, um, you know, why, why was Putin so wrong about Ukraine? Um, we know that his initial goal, he believed that he would conquer Kiev within 48 hours. Um, there were actually already newspaper articles prepared to welcome the great victory and so on. Um, none of it happened. Um, you've been following Putin for many, many, many years. Um, how do you explain that miscalculation? First of all, I think we have to um, understand that Ukraine for Putin was the same geopolitical obstacle as Poland for Stalin. And uh, Putin never made a secret of his plans to destroy Ukraine. He never recognized Ukraine as a sovereign state. For him, it was just a target, geopolitical target, that needed to be carved in pieces. Uh, and uh, uh, he uh, said it many times. Uh, and in 2014, he started uh, to um, materialize his plans of, of destroying Ukraine by annexing Crimea and also inciting violence uh, in the east and south of Ukraine. And uh, uh, you mentioned now the newspaper articles that were prepared. Uh, back in 2014, they had maps of so-called Novorossiya, New Russia, also prepared and printed. And this... Uh, um, Kvazi state included 10 Ukrainian regions stretching from Lugansk in, in the east to Odessa uh, uh, in, in the south. Uh, and uh, um, the reason it failed is because Ukrainian resistance, even then, despite the fact that the Ukrainian army was not prepared for this um, uh, uh, assault and Ukrainian government was in disarray after um, 
uh, collapse of Yanukovych administration and his escape. Uh, so it was all done just uh, in, in such a short time to, to build defenses and, uh, and organize the resistance, but Putin failed. Uh, but at that time, eight years ago, he was not ready for the full-scale invasion. He tried. Not that he didn't, uh, but the losses that Russia suffered in, in the war in eastern Ukraine uh, repelled him, and, um, and he decided that he could probably wait until a better moment. But since 2014, Russian propaganda uh, in 24-7 uh, uh, um, mode uh, talked about Ukraine as, as, as a state that, that had no rights to exist. Uh, in, in, in the strongest terms. So that's why for me, it was not a question of if, but only when. When Putin would decide to, to deliver the decisive blow. And, uh, and again, as many times in the past, he uh, was not even hiding in the darkness, preparing for his, for his attack. Uh, he um, spent the last 10 months building up uh, the um, massive army, um, presence uh, in the vicinity of Ukraine, surrounding it not only from uh, east, uh, uh, the east and, and the south, uh, but also uh, de facto occupying Belarus and preparing an assault to Kiev uh, from the north. Uh, he even brought part of his Pacific fleet to uh, uh, Black Sea, Pacific fleet. So um, it was not a secret. And uh, I think it was so obvious that Putin would attack, but it's very unfortunate that the free world uh, um, decided to uh, continue endless and absolutely useless negotiations with Putin, while Putin has been uh, building up his military force and making plans to um, uh, destroy Ukrainian sovereignty. As Anne just uh, just said, it's the, the, the plan was very simple. Uh, uh, to take over Kyiv for the two or three days, but it so should be a very short campaign. Uh, as a Russian uh, official said, to decapitate Ukrainian government, and decapitate means probably not only political uh, um, uh, a term, uh, um, and also um, uh, to install a puppet government, whether deposed president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, or some other... Uh, pro-Russian politicians there, like Boyko, God knows who. But uh, uh, having puppet government in Kyiv to uh, force free world to uh, negotiate uh, uh, from the position of weakness. Because Putin knew that if he could succeed, uh, he had no doubt, and I, I'm afraid he was right, that the free world would um, accept the new geopolitical reality, as they did in 2014, uh, um, uh, with, uh, with Crimea and would try to save whatever we can. Uh, uh, I can even hear the voices now, just it's all, all the Western politicians saying, so what, what else can we do? We, you know, we have to stop the war, we have to save Ukrainians, we have to preserve whatever can be preserved, so we will never recognize Putin's uh, uh, um, puppet government, but now we have to deal with them. It didn't happen, not because the free world showed um, uh, strengths, but because Ukrainians proved to be not just resilient, heroic, and, uh, and uh, President Zelensky's decision to stay in Kyiv, uh, uh, kindly rejecting uh, American offer to, to, to uh, be evacuated, I think that was a turning point. And failure to win the war in three days um, um, to, 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 uh, to, to achieve his main goal of uh, uh, destroying the Ukrainian government and installing the puppet government in Kyiv uh, led to the change of the tactics of Russian troops. If in the first three days they refrain from uh, attacks on civilian targets, uh, yeah, there, there, uh, there were some accidents. Uh, there were, I believe, accidental hits of the civilian targets. But clearly, they wanted to pretend to be liberators. And and uh, uh, in the first uh, 72 uh, hours, uh, they um, they tried to avoid unnecessary uh, casualties, so no collateral damage as much as they could, of course. But after failing uh, uh, to take uh, uh, to um, seize Kiev uh, and also failing to seize Kharkov, they changed the, 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 their strategy. And uh, from the fourth day of this war, uh, they they um, they no longer pay any any respect for civilian targets. But if at at that time 
it's they, it was indiscriminate indiscriminate uh, 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 um, uh, attack on civilians as as a collateral damage. I think now we're seeing a new phase of the war where it's intentional. So they want to bomb uh, uh, Ukrainians into into um, submission, same way they did in Grozny in 2000 or in 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 Syria. We should remember recall the uh, the carpet bombing of Aleppo in 2015. Uh, and uh, um, they recognize that the only way to win the war or just to achieve their goal of, of um, uh, uh, forcing Ukrainian government to, to surrender is to uh, mm, inflict massive damages among civilians. And uh, we are now facing the greatest humanitarian catastrophe in Europe since World War II. And it's very unfortunate that uh, uh, Putin sees no no obstacles on his way to continue uh, these uh, um, uh, war crimes on an industrial scale. So, you know, Gary, what's fascinating to me is how the nature of the Russian state has shaped this war. In other words, um, both the fact that Putin is now an aging, isolated dictator um, who believes his own propaganda. You know, he was you know, sit, sitting in a, some kind of COVID bunker for the last two years, reading God knows what made up history books. Um, and he actually convinced himself that the Ukrainian state isn't real. And he made that extraordinary speech um, uh, just as the war started a couple of weeks ago, um, in which he said something about Ukraine having been invented by Lenin. I mean, it was such a bizarre version of history that I, I had trouble even understanding where it was from. And I've written about that period of Ukrainian history myself. Um, and so you can see how his isolation um, his separation from, you know, from any kind of normal interaction with people had, you know, and of course, th those who he does interact with are yes men who just agree with whatever he says, how that had shaped his first miscalculation. And he thought the Ukrainians weren't, wouldn't fight back because there aren't any Ukrainians. Um, and I'm afraid that the nature of the Russian state is also shaping the second phase of the war. In other words, it's a, it is a profoundly brutal state. It does not care about human life. Um, you're correct to cite both Grozny and Aleppo as cities that have been destroyed in the past. Um, I suspect, in fact, that there's another element here, which is uh, something close to ethnic cleansing or genocide. In other words, if we can clear all of the Ukrainians out of um, cities, if we can get them out of Kherson, if we can get them out of Mariupol, then once they're gone, you know, those cities won't exist or we can fill them with other people. And that is also a very old Soviet tactic. It goes back a very long time, the idea that you can replace one population with another and thereby change the shape and nature of territory. And I think that is a, you know, it is precisely because this is a brutal autocracy, effectively a one-man dictatorship, much more so than the Soviet Union ever was, um, that we have, um, we have, we have the kind this the, this kind of war. Um, I think I would disagree with you a little bit on the West doing nothing. I've actually been impressed by the number and quantity of weapons that the Ukrainians are getting, and I've been impressed by the nature of the sanctions, which really are meant to shut the Russian economy down. And of course, that'll that'll take longer than than we than time than we may have. Um, but I now I think Yulia is now on the line. Um, is that correct? I, uh, Good evening. Yeah. Hi, I'm here. Hello. So, so Yulia, I, I, I wanted to shift the conversation now to you um, and to get you to speak about this from a, in, in a different way. In other words, if the nature of the Russian invasion really reflects the nature of Russian society, um, can you talk a little bit about what Ukrainians are doing to fight back? I know that you're a civic activist, you're involved in the humanitarian effort in Lviv. Can you talk about how um, you know, the, the, the Ukrainian tradition of civic activism and Ukrainian um, democratic traditions are shaping the way that Ukrainians are behaving now. Can you tell me what's going on around you um, and how it reflects the, the, the kind of society that you live in? Uh, and thank you for your questions. And first of all, um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm an uh, old friend of HRF and Oslo Freedom Forum, and I deeply appreciate all the efforts uh, that uh, Harry personally is doing to promote uh, democracy and also to be the voice uh, of Ukraine. Y uh, you, Harry, and you, Anne, I know that you are speaking for Ukraine uh, for many, many years. And um, as a Ukrainian, I deeply appreciate that. Uh, now regarding the situation... Um, so uh, me and my family, we had to leave our home. Uh, I'm originally from Kyiv uh, in the uh, second day of uh, shillings. Uh, 
uh, I spent a night uh, in a bombshell and uh, after one of the uh, uh, rockets uh, almost hit it, like it, it hit at a house a few blocks from uh, my street. We just packed in 15 minutes and uh, left our home with all my family and moved to the western Ukraine. So currently I'm coordinating lots of humanitarian aid and also um, working on uh, implementing harsher sanctions uh, on Russia. And um, I couldn't believe that that's already two weeks as a full-scale war is happening in my country. That's uh, that's really unimaginable situation because that's definitely happened overnight. The day before the shillings, I was working on a strategy for a UN project in Ukraine, and the next, like in a, in in two days, I'm becoming like a refugee uh, in my own country, and I. Uh, my friends are losing their friends. We are losing parts of our families. We are losing territories one by one. Um, so, you know, and I'm I'm <laughs> continuing to get these questions like about trying to persuade Russians uh, and my attitude toward Russia and so on. And I just want to say that I I'm not trying to persuade any Russian. I'm putting all my efforts to support Ukrainians, to support Ukrainian uh, fight, to fight to, to to find uh, bulletproof vests, to find weapons, to find medicines for our emergency uh, emergencies that are on the front line. Um, you know, I know that like 70% of Russian population is supporting what Putin is doing. And I know that you, Russian, Russia was trying to occupy your Ukraine in every possible way for hundreds of years. So for, now, for, for, for our society, from Ukrainian perspective, what Russia is doing is absolutely logical continuation of the of of russian ukrainian history so they were trying to to get us for hundreds of years and and and, and that's not and and now that's happening uh in the huge scale and you know one thing about um uh, like what really shocked me was that on the second day of shillings when i like w woke up from the sounds of like my beloved Kiev, my city was bombed I I really expected that uh, we, we would have like an immediate closure of any economic trade with Russia, that we will have like immediate ban of Russia on all possible levels. And it took almost a week to close six or seven banks uh, for SWIFT transactions. Can you imagine? And the biggest banks like Sberbank or uh, Gazbank that are trading oil and gas are still not banned. They are still operating. So... I don't think that economic sanctions should be so slow. I I really think that West should have moved much faster that uh, it just probably like I'm I'm continuing to hear about like um this situation that uh, um very strong moves would provocate Putin but I think what provocates Putin is this weakness is not Putin like really severe sanctions is not giving weapons to Ukraine that what makes Putin stronger and that what brings war closer to Europe so uh, that's that's my first uh, feelings I I'm really shocked uh, with what is happening uh, in Ukraine. I see that hospitals are being bombed I see that museums are being destroyed uh, thousands of people thousands of civil civilians are being killed from from other side i'm seeing unbelievable unity of ukrainian society uh, people of different professions are stopping any projects are stopping their work just to help the front line uh, you know when i'm reading some russian news that uh, there was a coordinated attack on Russian uh, state websites, uh, on Russian internet from Ukrainian government. I know that that's like a bunch of IT guys that are just uh, sitting together and arranging this as uh, volunteers. I know that like volunteer, like uh, the the uh, volunteers that I'm working with, uh, we are renting planes to deliver humanitarian aid to Ukraine. So. Uh, that's something that Putin will never get about Ukraine, that we are not a um, vertical society. If he will change Zelensky, Ukrainian, Ukrainian society will continue to fight at the same level. So it's not about Zelensky here. It's about Ukrainians hating Putin and fighting for freedom 
for hundreds of years. So we're not going to stop. We're going to win this war. And the whole world can be with us in this fight or can observe. And then we'll have more victims. You know, Yulia, I'm glad you spoke about that Ukrainian tradition. Um, I've written about Ukraine in the 19th and 20th centuries, and it is remarkable. I mean, starting really in the 18th century, but developing in the 19th century, there's this long tradition of civic activism um, and often suspicion of the state, which doesn't didn't serve Ukraine well always when it even when it got its own state. Um, in the early 1990s, but suspicion of the state, suspicion of authority, and this incredible ability to organize on the ground. And of course, what you're describing, um, what the resistance is doing, is sounds a lot like how people supported the Maidan in 2014. You know, people dropping everything. You know, people leaving work and going down to demonstrate. You know, middle class people bringing their cars in to feed people who were demonstrating, and so on. So it it sounds very much um, like this is. Um, like this is a this is a part of you know very very long um, Ukrainian tradition. Um, uh, Gary, let me ask you one other thing. Um, you also know you know Russian society very well, um, and you yourself were an activist inside Russia very for many years, and you have many contacts there. Um, you, you know, Yulia just said that she thinks that seventy percent of Russians support the war. Do you think that's true, or do you think that that will change over time? I I, I can't help but wonder whether information isn't going to get through um, even via Instagram and other forms of social media, and whether you know, people will really support this in the long term, especially as the sanctions begin to bite. I don't think we can give an exact number of Russians supporting the war uh, because now Putin's regime eliminated uh, all the independent outlets that could um, help us to measure the temperature of Russian society. Um, the, the, the only attempt that I'm aware of was done by Alexei Navalny's team and it's, it ends up with numbers that are n- not even close to 70%. You can also look uh, at, um, this, at the optics. Uh, annexation of Crimea definitely had support of probably 70% or even more. This is nothing like that nowadays in Russia. And uh, um, while there was an anti-war protest organized by, by um, uh uh, opposition leaders like Alexei Navalny, Boris Nemtsov, uh, especially Boris, late Boris Nemtsov, in 2014 to, uh, um, in, in Moscow, it was not spontaneous protest across the country. Now we see something different. Uh, uh, tens of thousands of people made to the streets. And uh, opposing war on the streets of Russia today, it's a crime by, by the draconian laws uh, um, adopted by Putin's puppet parliament. So people know that if they show up uh, saying no, no war, uh, they could be beaten, uh, detained, uh, or, and, or even you know, thrown into prison for years. So that tells, tells us that there's a very deep rejection of war among many, many Russians. If you have tens of thousands of people, and I say tens of thousands because uh, over the last uh, uh, two weeks, 13,000 Russians have been arrested. So we definitely can talk about the number that is probably exceeding 100,000. That means that many more are sympathetic, but just do not have courage to make it to the streets. And also on the other side, we see no spontaneous support for the war. I think passive support, yes. That I, we hear interviews of people saying, yes, we believe the propaganda, but that's def, 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 very different from the euphoria of 2014. And uh, um, and I think it depends. It's 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 depends on the level of propaganda. So the, if it stops now, I don't see um, any any deep down af- uh, um, uh, affection uh, uh, and support for for the war, especially now when more and more people just recognize that it's uh, it's not exactly what they they, they have been told. Uh, uh, it's not a military exercise. It's not a special operation. It's a war, and body bags arriving. So uh, today, the Russian Minister of Defense refuted Putin's words about um, conscripts uh, because Putin said many times, "No conscripts, only professional military." Now they said, "Oh, the mistakes were made. Some of them ended up in Ukraine, and we will investigate uh, and we will punish those generals who who let it happen." But the fact is that they have to recognize that uh, it's it's the entire Russian army fighting in Ukraine. It seems to me that this the 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 situation in Russian society is not is not as as 
simple and straightforward as eight years ago. Though I, I, I have to say that it's, we are we are yet to see the moment where millions of people are, are ready to to join protest uh, uh, that that could uh, threaten Putin's um, uh, uh, rule. Mm-hmm. Um, Yulia, you're um, you're on the ground, and I, I I heard your plea for more and faster things to be done. And um, you know, I, I I'm I'm with you, and I've repeated that myself um, quite a bit in the last few days. But tell me, from your perspective, what is working? So, what is the what Western aid is working? Which projects are working? I mean, you were talking about um, getting airplanes to fly aid into Ukraine. Who do you see who's been successful in in helping the Ukrainians? So so that's a full scale war. So the first and the most needed things are uh, weapons. And uh, I think that uh, Turkish Bayraktars are working pretty well, destroying Russian planes. And uh, mm, like all the uh, support with weapons and ammunition is vital. And that's something that go that, that goes direct to the front line. We are also getting lots of medicine, but uh, I just I understand that it's much easier to support Ukraine in a like humanitar- more in a humanitarian way uh, with with like food and uh, I know medicine. But what Ukraine needs is weapons. Uh, m- medicine is also important, and there are some hospitals that are lacking it. And I am working with a foundation that are bringing uh, medicines to Ukraine. Uh, but uh, let's save people's life with defending them at the first stage. So uh, I, I cannot say that all the uh, international efforts were, uh, were really successful. Uh, some organizations are getting uh, uh, a lot of negative PR, I would say, not going into, into the cities that are uh, occupied, like Bucha, uh, Vorzel, Chernihiv, which is understandable, you know, the cities are full with Russians, and but and but people are literally literally dying there uh, in the bombshells without food or without water, and it's just impossible to reach out to them. So only Ukrainians, uh, mostly Ukrainians, are like taking their own private cars and going there to uh, bring some food or take people out uh, of this the most dangerous places. So that's a real full-scale war. And it's hard to say that uh, um, humanitarian projects are the most effective at this way, at this moment. At this moment, governments must step in. Uh, United States must step in. Uh, now we need like uh, military allies to win this war. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've I've seen in the last few days there have been more weapon deliveries, and I I gather there are more on the way. Um, there is this difficult question, which I've I've been arguing about all day long in different fora for the last several days, which is what the West can do without provoking a nuclear conflict. Um, uh, I I I just had an argument with a senior academic who's a specialist in this area and who was was arguing for example against the use of uh of um you know of of western airplanes in ukraine because if one is shot down or if one shoots down a russian plane then that could be used as a casus belli um by putin i mean gary when you look at that problem um what do you see what 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 is your estimate of putin's willingness to use nuclear weapons and do you think that he's successfully blackmailing us is he bluffing um because most of the american analysts think he's not i wonder whether all these american analysts you know they were correct in predicting putin's moves in the past because we have now the army of russian experts but uh, something tells me that they were wrong on every count, on every turn, <laughs> telling us about, about Putin's plans. So I think that the opinion of those who were wrong should be disqualified. Um, not that I know the, it's, it's what's going to happen and whether Putin is bluffing or not, but at least, you know, uh, those of us who were right in predicting Putin's aggression. So they should be, you know, should having the, the first say and, uh, and, uh, and I, would, um, I would dismantle this as the aura of the... Uh, of credibility that is surrounded these so-called experts. Now, um, 
Speaking about the uh, free world uh, support, supply of Ukraine with, with lethal weapons, uh, yeah, you just said that you, 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 you disagreed with me slightly about this level of support. Uh, what I said, actually, is that uh, if Putin succeeded in, in, in winning the war in three, four days, taking over Kiev, they would be negotiating with him. And, yeah. and the supply of, of lethal weapons to Ukraine was, was late. You, yes, I agree with that. Yeah. U.S. intelligence have been predicting Putin's attack on Ukraine for months. Yes. And, uh, and Biden is not Trump. He, I, I, I guess he, he, he trusted his intelligence. Now, the question is why these weapons were not supplied to Ukraine on time. If Ukraine right. had uh, surface-to-air um, uh, missiles, and especially the missiles that could, could, could sink Russian planes, uh, not Russian, Russian warships in, um, in, in the Black Sea, that could be a very different ballgame. So the, the West failed to, to, to arm Ukraine. Germany kept refusing to, uh, uh, sending lethal weapons to Ukraine, even on the second day, uh, as, as, as long as um, far as the second day of the war. What's happened is the public opinion. Public opinion yeah. forced uh, Americans, Germans, French, uh, uh, and Brits to actually take a very strong stand. Now, speaking about um, the escalation, I, I find this argument absolutely useless because if, if we believe to Biden, and and uh, um, and his administration that America would defend uh, uh, any every inch of NATO territory. Then the whole argument: Oh, um, esc- we are afraid of the con- of the military conflict with with nuclear power is useless. It's either you're willing to take to take on Putin's um, uh, uh, army or you're not, because. Uh, um, very few uh, uh, um, people can have doubts now that if Putin, God forbid, succeeds in Ukraine, so uh, um, he will definitely taste NATO. Uh, and uh, um, the problem is, you know, this, it's the willingness to defend Lithuanian or Pol- Polish territory um, it should be demonstrated now by helping Ukraine. So, um, and also the uh, whether Putin is bluffing or not, it's probably a secondary question. Let's say he's not bluffing, and I. I can probably buy this argument, though we never know, because he, 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 he always bluffed and he always won. So the West uh, uh, folded cards when Putin bluffed and, and raised stakes, having a very weak hand. But let's say he's not bluffing. I think the question is no longer about Putin. Whether this maniac in the bunker, you know, willing to give order to use nukes is one story. The question is who will carry the orders through? Especially if we're talking about tactical nuclear weapons, they they are in the hands of the Russian commanders on the ground or 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 in the sea. I personally I have big doubts that they will be willing to die for Putin's paranoia and for Putin's geopolitical uh, fantasies. Um, and as for Russian pilots, I'm not sure there will be many, if any of them, willing to die in the in the, in the skies of Ukraine if NATO imposed no fly zone. Yeah, they can be given an order, but those who are so brave by bombing uh, hospitals uh, and kindergartens, I, something tells me that they will be much less inclined to put their lives at stake. Yes, that was more or less the argument that I made um, today. So um, I, I I do agree with you. Um, Alexander, I think you were collecting some questions from the audience. Is that correct? Yes, uh, we have some questions. And for anyone who missed the opening, if you do have a question, please send me a DM on Twitter um, and I'll try and, you know, try and get to you. Um, One of the first questions that's come up, and I think that actually this relates to what you've been talking about just now, is, you know, a lot of people before the invasion were predicting that, you know, there's no way that Russia can invade because this would be such a big quagmire for Putin and could really undermine his power if it fails. And so I guess, you know, the question paraphrasing is, now, is regime change in Russia possible? Is this, did Putin make a big mistake, you know, attacking Ukraine? You know, the Ukrainians have defended themselves so heroically and are continuing to fight back. And, um, you know, what prospects do you see for uh, Putin losing power in Russia? And could we be, could we be on the precipice of a sort of, you know, new international order where um, actually the autocracies are in retreat? I mean, that's that's really the question of the hour. Um, uh, you, you know, the the you know the the thing that the piece of it that we don't know is who inside Russia, who inside Moscow would would be the person who would get rid of Putin. I mean, one of the strange things we don't even have a Politburo now. There isn't. We don't really know who's in the chain of command. We don't know who's around Putin or what the mechanism by which he would be removed would be. I mean, I think it's certainly true that he 
miscalculated. And in fact, one of the reasons why a lot of people in Europe and actually a lot of Ukrainians didn't believe in the attack um, was precisely what you just said. I mean, it was incredible that he thought he could occupy Ukraine with 150,000 troops. That was never going to work and it's not working. Um, and so, you know, that was the, you know, people, people knew in advance that he'd made a wrong guess. Um, and nevertheless, because he's isolated and so on, um, he made it. Um, but Gary, what do you think? Um, is this a is that a is this a possible moment of change? Um, and if, do, do you have a sense of what the mechanism of change would be? Yes, I think it's possible. Uh, but I also can add that I don't think Putin ever planned to occupy entire Ukraine. He's he's mad, but not that mad to think that 150 to 170 thousand soldiers can occupy the country uh, as big as Ukraine with 44 million uh, uh, citizens. Uh, the idea was to destroy Ukraine's sovereignty and to install a puppet government. And 150,000 soldiers was more than enough for this goal. And then to negotiate with the free world, same, same as he did after the annexation of Crimea. So his miscalculation was about Ukrainian resistance and also about the lousy uh, performance of Russian army that was you know, uh, um, ruined from inside by the corruption and, and, and uh, unprofessionalism. But those were real mistakes. And then the, the rise of the, of the public anger that forced uh, Western governments to, to act decisively. Uh, now it's Gagmire. We all, we all agree. Uh, but it's, it's still too early to say about the collapse of the regime because it requires several components. One, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, always number one uh, factor, it's a geopolitical and military defeat. So that was Afghanistan for the Soviet Union. And uh, Ukraine could be this trigger that will, will lead to events in Russia that could be also precipitated by, by the sanctions. But again, what I don't know is that's whether the free world is willing to use sanctions for regime change. Because we're hearing uh, noises that, yes, sanctions could be lifted if, if the war is over. What does it mean? So if Putin somehow decides, okay, time to, to, to um, call it all, call it over and agree on some sort of the ceasefire, that means the sanctions will be lifted or what? So um, my view is that the free world must consider this war in Ukraine not as a game of chess, but as, as a battle where, where there's no tie. It's either we win or Putin wins. And if sanctions are just, you know, are just are being held for, for a relatively long period of time, even a few months, really tough sanctions, uh, financial, economic, technological, very important, technological, uh, and, and also supported by total diplomatic isolation of Russia, I think we may see that's the, that this combination of factors could lead to massive revolt uh, uh, social economic, social economic uh, uh, revolt of millions of Russians. And if Putin runs out of money to support his police force, his security apparatus and propaganda machine, I don't care who is going to, to uh, um, uh, pull the trigger or just do whatever, you know, to eliminate him. Let's, let, let them decide, you know, who, who wants to be a hero, uh, uh, um, uh, saving, the, the, saving uh, his, his own skin. But I'm, I'm no doubt that Putin uh, regime can collapse very quickly because it was always based on his ability to control hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars uh, and, uh, and use this money uh, to um, advance his agenda both domestically and internationally. It's a mafia structure, uh, loyalty in exchange for personal gains. And if Putin is no longer seen by, by, by his henchmen and cronies as the defender of their interest, I don't think they will be serving his, he, he, uh, him and I don't think they, they will... Uh, uh, keep the loyalty to to the fall uh, to the uh, falling boss. Mm -hmm. uh, you, Yulia, as a Ukrainian, what would you like the goal of U.S. sanctions to be, or international sanctions to be? How long would you like them to stay on? It's a good question. Uh, of course, uh, I, as a Ukrainian, I think that Putin's regime has to be destroyed, and uh, there will be no freedom to Ukraine, no democracy in Ukraine, while Putin's author authoritarian regime is in place. So I think sanctions should be in place until Putin and his cronies are destroyed and until this mafia state is destroyed and democracy established in Russia. And I think that's the only way that Ukraine and Europe and the world can feel safe. Otherwise, they will just continue to terrorize uh, the whole world. And I want to come back to the point about uh, the nuclear threat. 
uh, and I think that uh, it is not taken seriously enough because Ukraine has uh, not only Chernobyl, but five more active nuclear plants. And at least uh, uh, two of them are occupied now by Russia. Uh, one, which is bigger than Chernobyl, Enerhodar, had a huge fire two days ago made by Russians. Uh, and when we are speaking about no-fly zone, uh, at least making this no-fly zone over Chernobyl and Enerhodar and other huge nuclear plants would be a very logical and even, I don't know, smart way to save the uh, future of this planet. So mm, I think there is no way the, the world can develop uh, and live as before without getting rid of Putin as a politician. Mm -hmm. that's, that's clear. Um, Alexander, do you have another question for us? Yes, and thank you so much everyone for sending in all your questions. I'm very sorry we won't be able to get to all of them. But one of the questions that I've seen come up a few times is, you know, what can normal people, not politicians in the West, in America, and all over the world really do to support, you know, freedom and democracy in Ukraine? I mean, we've seen big protests in Berlin and in Prague and countries all over the world. Um, but are there any concrete actions that, you know, individuals um, can take to really uh, make sure that the Ukrainians, you know, win this war and that, to, you know, defeat Putin? Maybe this is a question best answered by Yulia. Uh, yes, Alexander. Uh, I think that everyone is important in this war. And uh, first of all, like I see this war not only as a uh, Russian-Ukrainian war. I see th this war as a war between um, kleptocracy uh, and democracy and uh, uh, we already see that uh, other countries are becoming a, a part of this war, like Belarus, uh, Belarus, excuse me, and other uh, and other countries that are um, some of them are providing weapons and uh, uh, becoming somehow a part of this war. So uh, everyone can fight uh, against this pure evil uh, with the different steps. Uh, in the level of information, you know. Uh, Putin is uh, running a huge uh, disinformation campaign. You can uh, always spread the truth in your social network. You can uh, talk to media. You can talk to your friends. You can uh, spread the information about uh, war in Ukraine. Because we all know that media cycle is short. In two weeks, everyone would uh, switch to another topics. But the war will continue in Ukraine. I understand that it's not going to end very soon. Uh, another thing uh, is uh, pushing your governments regarding uh, giving weapons to Ukraine and imposing uh, harder sanctions on Russia. Uh, another thing is uh, putting pressure on businesses, on uh, private companies that are still working in Russia, which is a huge shame. For example, Shell buying oil from Russia, just never use, uh, I don't know, the gas stations. Just be conscious about companies that are supporting uh, Russia with their money because this is the money that Russia spends on war and uh, war at that moment with Uk at this moment in Ukraine but in the future <laughs> with everyone else so um, and of course if you can support organizations that you trust that are working on the ground in Ukraine please do if you help if you can help Ukrainian refugees I'm deeply grateful and deeply appreciate everyone who is hosting uh, Ukrainians supporting uh, with the food, clothes, uh, uh, that's, and even with the, I don't know, good word and the human uh, support from heart to heart, that's a, a big thing. Uh, and I know that there are thousands of uh, people from all, um, all over the world, the world who are coming to Ukraine to fight, literally to fight. That's also a big deal. So there is always a, w a way to support. The only thing just do not observe. I think that's the worst that can happen, just to be a silent observer uh, of this horrific crime that is happening in the heart of Europe. Uh, uh, I would like to add that is that's, uh, keep pressure on the government and on media. Uh, it's the, it, as I already said, the decisive response from the West was a result of, of public anger and, and uh, protest and, and support of Ukraine. And politicians in the free world have no choice but to respond. 
to to this to this pressure. So I never let them off the hook. And uh, so many things were just you know they are still you know trying to sit on the fence, push them, push them all, all, over over the Ukrainian side. Uh, no fly zone is, is is for me its biggest priority now. But make sure that the the, the news do not do not. Uh, uh, disappear from the front page of a newspaper. So that's that's very important because the solidarity with Ukraine is more just the story of Ukraine. It's, it's solidarity of the free world against oppressors, dictators, thugs, and terrorists. And and I think that the eventual victory, and I believe victory in Ukraine, will will signal the change of this trend uh, over the last uh, 15 years at least of of democracy losing ground to us you know recovering this this ground and gaining gaining uh, more and more territory countries into into the family of of democratic nations yeah i would i would add only that i tweeted a couple of times a list of approved ukrainian charities that that you know that we know are good and you're sending to a real address and these are both military charities you can help the ukrainian army directly um, and there are also a number of medical veteran um, children's charities as well and i will i'll do i'll tweet it again after after this conversation um, alexander maybe one more question Yes, um, it, just to quickly say, HRF also has a list of vetted and a, you know, carefully chosen charities. It's on our website. So uh, those charities will only be dealing with humanitarian aid. Um, but again, if you'd like to support Ukraine financially, those are some of the best organizations that you can give to. Um, so one of the last questions, uh, the last question that I have for you um, from our listeners is, you know, has, you know, the world changed already? You know, we've seen you know, changes in German foreign policy. We've seen a kind of worldwide, you know, movement to support Ukrainians. Do you think that, you know, that there is now going to be a different thread in European politics, in American politics? Are we seeing a shift in the way that politics are, are done around, around the world? Has Ukraine become a kind of catalyst for change? Um, can you see this crisis kind of re-energizing democracies around the world? So I, I wrote something along those lines a few days ago. Um, you know, y yes, I do think that the active participation of the Ukrainians that Yulia has described so beautifully, um, as well as the um, the language and behavior of Zelensky, um, you know, demonstrating what it looks like, what civic courage looks like, and what bravery looks like to people, um, has had a really galvanizing effect, particularly in Europe, actually. Um, where people simply didn't believe in the Ukrainians, they didn't understand the Ukrainians, they didn't feel empathy for the Ukrainians, and really now they do. And that has been a, that's been a sea change. I mean, I, it's very, very important that it be kept up um, and that both the things that both Gary and Yuli just, you know, ask people to continue, you know, continue sharing it, talking about it, speaking about it, um, because moods will change and people will be distracted. Um, but keep it, reminding people of what, of how important this is um, I think can change European politics in some fundamental ways, but I, there's there's still a long way to go, as I'm sure Gary will agree. Uh, no, I agree with with you, Anne. That it's it's we we are witnessing the sea of change, and you mentioned the change in in uh, German foreign um, a policy that uh, has been in place since what 1969, the when Willy Brandt declared this Ostpolitik. And it somehow continued with uh, Gerhard Schroeder and Angela Merkel, uh, and now it's 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 a it's 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 a different world, and it's again it's because of the heroic resistance of Ukraine and of course personal heroism of of, of Vladimir Zelensky. I think his uh, his famous response to American kind offer to evacuate, so I don't need a right, I need ammunition. That's you know that will be in history books alongside with the most famous quotes of Winston Churchill when he spoke about Hitler's aggression. Um, and uh, and that, that's what changes the world. People now can feel that it's it's no longer um, soulless uh, consumer society. Ukraine is demonstrating that it's, there's things that it's worth fighting for and dying for. And I think that will have an impact, not only in, in the unfree countries, uh, where people you know, will be energized by, by this heroic fight against Russian aggression, but also in, in, the, in the democratic countries. I think a lot of people in America or in Europe, they now may reconsider their participation in, in democracy. They'll recognize that democracy is fragile and we all have to be active participants in it. So I, I, I cannot even overestimate 
the importance of 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 this war and the heroism of of, of Ukrainians uh, fighting the aggressor uh, uh, and its impact for not for only for the present uh, moment but also for the future of democracy and and the future of mankind. Uh, Yulia, we're coming up to the end of the hour, but I feel you should have the last word. Um, you, you know, what would you like to tell the listeners on this call? Um, has the world changed and how should it change further? Uh, and I think that uh, it's a changing point uh, because uh, the, wor like, the world can change in a different ways and the democracies and politics in the world has to change because now it's kind of a uh, crossing point of a moral choice. And our politics can change from, be, from staying on economy only to staying on humanity and moral. And uh, it will really, it will change for real when gas will become cheaper than human lives. Because for many years, Putin was empowered by world politicians because he was providing cheap oil and gas. And now it's a changing point. Let's, let's change our politics. Let's choose democracy. Let's choose human lives. Let's choose morality. So I hope that it will become a changing point. And um, what I know for sure that now is a changing point for Eastern Europe because a new strong democracy is emerging and it's Ukraine. We are changing dramatically. We are changing dramatically as a society. Each of us and our community in, in general, we are challenging our politicians. We are challenging ourselves and we challenged our view of the world. Uh, we have no questions about our, about our identity anymore. We have no, uh, we are not divided for like East and West as it was before. Uh, now we are United Nation. We want to be a strong and successful democracy. And we see for ourselves that we have enough strengths to make that happen. Yulia, thank, thank you so much. And we, we wish you, um, you know, more than well, we wish you great success. Um, and thank, thank you thank also you. To, to Gary. Um, and let me turn, turn back to Alexander and let him, let him finish this conversation. Yes, thank you so much, Anne. Thank you so much, Gary. And, you know, thank you, Yulia. Our, you know, our thoughts are m most clearly with you and, and we do wish you, you know, victory in, in, in your war against, against Russia and Putin. Um, thank, thank you also to all of our listeners uh, for joining us. We will be having more conversations like this one. So please, you know, subscribe to our channel and of course, subscribe to our three wonderful guests. They are some of the, you know, bravest and smartest people um, out there and know a lot about the current conflict. So if you want to know more, definitely, definitely follow them. Uh, this conversation was recorded. So in the coming days, you will be able to find it on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Music, and YouTube. Um, and if you missed any part of it, you'll be able to listen to it there. Um, so thank you very much once again. And you know, stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.